By the time M.T. Jones died two years later, he had named his nephew an executor of his substantial estate. Jesse Jones headed to Houston to settle his uncle's affairs, and he soon discovered his uncle M.T. had left him something more useful than money. His uncle was an established civic leader, a rich man. And when he managed his estate, he managed this estate of over a million dollars. And in doing so, he met bankers and businessmen all over the state of Texas. And Jesse wasted little time putting his new connections to work. First, he convinced the bankers he now knew to lend him enough money to buy his own lumber yard. Within a few years, he turned the one yard into a chain of 65. From dealing in lumber, he moved into building houses, which he sold on long-term credit. His aggressive lending soon earned him a nickname, 10% Jones, for the interest rates he sometimes charged. Lending and borrowing with equal success, he began to build a business empire, all of it on credit. More than one local banker worried that the young tycoon was way overextended. The story is often told that one of the local bankers came and said, Jesse, we heard the rumor that you've borrowed a million dollars. And he looked at him with a straight face and said, well, I'm sorry to tell you that rumor's wrong. I borrowed three million dollars, <laughs> which was an unheard of sum in 1905, 1906, but he would routinely borrow in the millions. Jones' unorthodox business practices didn't always win him friends among Houston's business leaders, but they had to admire his success. Inevitably, he became a part of the city's high society. This was a man who was very tall, very handsome, exceedingly well-dressed, a bachelor, so uh, I think Mr. Jones must have cut a swath. Uncle Jess was one of Houston's most eligible bachelors. I know he had quite a way with the ladies. So at 30, why was he still not married? It was because he was waiting for the woman he truly loved, who was already taken she was Mary Gibbs Jones, and she had a background Uncle Jess just did not have. She was educated, well-read, and world-traveled. From all accounts, she was attracted to him, too. There was just one problem. She was married to Uncle Jess's first cousin, Will Jones. According to family lore, Will was more interested in the good life than being a good husband. But back then, divorce was simply out of the question. So Uncle Jess visited Aunt Louisa and the extended Jones family as often as possible and stayed as close as he could to Mary and his cousin Will. The ambitious young man who was used to getting everything he wanted would have to wait 15 years to get the woman he loved. Meanwhile, his business ventures thrived, even while others floundered. In 1907, when a nationwide recession wiped out fortunes more stable than Jones's, skeptical Houstonians expected him to stumble. But he saw the panic coming and turned everything he could into cash. Jones emerged from the 1907 panic in better financial shape than almost anyone else in Houston. His business touch now tested by crisis. He was sure his success would come from building and banking. Within weeks, he made an announcement that astonished Houston. He would build three new downtown buildings taller than any the city had seen. He became half owner of the city's largest newspaper. 
and invested in local banks. Why was he driven to make so much money? Even when he had a lot of money, why was he driven to make more and more and more? Perhaps because he considered this a game. He evidently did enjoy the simple art of making money. But Jones knew he would prosper only if Houston grew, and that Houston's success would help elevate the entire South. This idea, I think, comes partly from the fact that men like Jones had lived in small towns, small towns where the elite was responsible directly for things that happened, and they brought that image to Houston. In a way, it's saying, this is my destiny, and if Houston fails, so will I, and if Houston succeeds, then my horizons are almost unlimited. But Houston's growth was constrained by its geography. It had no deep water access to the sea. Jones took a lead role in getting federal funds to help dredge a deep channel to the Gulf of Mexico. When it opened in 1914, the ship channel internationalized Houston overnight and boosted the economy of the entire region. It also turned the spotlight on the man who helped make it happen. He was well on his way from being called 10% Jones to a nickname that he liked much better, Mr. Houston. And his growing reputation brought him to the attention of the man who would change the course of his life, President Woodrow Wilson. Wilson's reformist zeal already had captivated Jones. He was attracted by the president's promises to bust monopolies and promote the South and West. And Wilson saw in Jesse Jones a new progressive financier, independent of the powerful East Coast financial establishment. By 1917, Wilson had offered Jones two ambassadorships and the position of Secretary of Commerce. Jones was tempted, but turned down the president to continue building his business and his city. But when America entered World War I, Wilson called on Jones once again, this time for a more urgent purpose, organizing battlefield aid for the American Red Cross. He turned his business over to a trusted associate, put on a Red Cross uniform, and headed for Washington. With the war and the crisis that the war emphasized, there was a degree of, of idealism and otherness in the Red Cross job, a, a chance to do something for humanity, if you will, that was absent in an ordinary peacetime cabinet post. In battle-torn France, Red Cross ambulances are familiar sights. Jones mobilized ambulances, nurses, doctors, and field hospitals at lightning speed. When the troops came home and America celebrated the end of the war, Jones was anxious to return to Houston and resume building his empire. But first, he had one more task to complete, making the Red Cross a permanent international relief agency. As world leaders gathered in France to hammer out the World War I peace agreements, Jones went as an ambassador for his cause. For a young man who had grown up in Tennessee, Paris in 1919 uh, must have seemed like a whole new world. And the proximity to the makers and shakers of the time must have produced its own extraordinary excitement. Jones lobbied hard to create an institution that would address calamities around the world the Red Cross that we know today. From war-ravaged Europe, he wrote home to Houston that business would have to wait. His letter said, for one to know the conditions existing as I see them and be content to go about his own affairs is more than I can understand. Unlike many capitalists in America, Jones divided his life uh, in half and spent much of his adult life trying to help democracy at times at the expense of his practice of capitalism. 